k-means and clustering, I guess, uh, algorithms can be used in this area. Looking forward. Thank you for this very nice introduction. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for the uh, opportunity. Also, thanks for the uh, talker before me, because uh, the RAND version stood out the most, and I'm doing probability theory, so maybe this <laughs> um, helps. Also, I'm a mathematician, so I hope the people who joined don't leave immediately. And yeah, I'm dealing with the question, uh, which kind of looks like this. So imagine you have point clouds. I guess some of you know k-means clustering or some other clustering um, algorithms, but usually they only consider single points. But I'm actually interested in clustering whole po cloud points. Here you see an example of two. All right. And what I'm also interested in is um, what to do if we don't know everything. So missing values and introducing no bias. In this case, this means maybe financial institutions, which are smaller, don't have to report everything. I start off slow and uh, do a quick recap of k-means, which I guess most of you know. So imagine nine points on the plane and you want to put them into three clusters. What k-means does is the following. You get a blue, a purple and a green cluster with three points and you have these red crosses. So for example, the red cross in the left bottom corner is just the mean, therefore k-means, or the average of the three blue points. All right, a mathematical slide to formalize this a bit. Um, suppose you have n points in Rd, x1 to xn, and you have a given k, which will be the number of clusters you want to have. Then k-means problem can be formalized as this following minimization problem, meaning you want to find k centroids, uh, we will call them, and you want to find a vector of assignment. So ai equals j means that you put cluster uh, point xi into cluster j, and then you want to minimize this kind of total variance, which means you want to be as close to each point as possible. And okay, and then there's this classic Lloyd algorithm, which iterates the following two steps. There's the cluster assignment step and the centroid calculating step. So given some centroids, you put each point to the cluster to which its centroid it's closest to. So, so good so far. And the second step, you want to calculate new centroids given some assignment. So you just, for each centroid, you set it to be the mean of all the points in that cluster. So yeah, you sum over all the i's which have cluster membership j. And this can also be formalized as the right thing here uh, because the average solves this uh, variance minimization problem. Maybe I had to prove this already in some exercises. So. And we need this in a bit. I said I also want to deal with missing values. So consider again the same nine points, but from two points, you don't know one coordinate. So from this, this is illustrated by this line here. I know the X coordinate, but I don't know the Y coordinate for the other point correspondingly. And we don't want to do what is mostly done, just impute it somehow. So for example, if you p impute this one by the mean, it will be somewhere here, and it will actually be closer to here. Although if you only look at the coordinate we know, it's somehow closer to here. So this is what uh, our algorithm does. Um, you obtain basically the same three clusters, uh, but what changes is how we do the cluster membership, so the assignment step, and how we calculate the new centroid. So for example, this red cross here, in the X coordinate, it's the average of the three points which are in that cluster, but in the Y coordinate, the one missing value doesn't play a role. So we just use those two y coordinates to calculate the y coordinate of the centroid. And we see basically the same slide I had um, two minutes earlier. I just put some pi's in blue at some places, uh, which means uh, projections. So we think of points we observe not um, as projected points onto some lower dimensional space, meaning it projects a point on those coordinates we actually observe. So we don't expect the full. Uh, see the full point, but only the projection. And then we have the same minimization problem, but again, we just put the projections here. And then we suggest to do the same algorithm, but again, just using projections. So we assign each point to that cluster to which in that coordinates, the closest centroid is. And then we do the uh, centroid updating step, 
meaning that uh, we solved this minimization problem and we had the slides before earlier. Classically, if all projections were the identity, we would obtain the average. In this case, we obtain the average in each coordinate of the points who actually have that coordinate. And it's interesting actually that this, uh, that this loss function was already considered in some paper, but this uh, uh, kind of intuitive algorithm not. All right, I told you I want to cluster point clouds. And what we needed in k-means where we needed a distance and we needed to form averages. So we want to generalize this and we want to do this uh, for point clouds. And what here comes into play is the field of optimal transport, uh, which I want to explain uh, very quickly on, in a simple case. Suppose you have n points on RD. Think of uh, the logo of the Fasen Perk, which is here represented as 10,000 black points on the plane, so in R2. And then you have another set of 10,000 points let's say the University of Vienna. And then the optimal transport is made of two words. The second word is transport. So you actually, a transport is a map which maps each of the black points from the logo of the FH to the logo of the uh, university. And there are many <laughs> combinations you could do. You could, uh, yeah, I guess it's clear that there could be many ways. And then you want to find the optimal one, the second word, so want to actually choose that transport where as little as possible has to be moved. And then what you obtain is kind of some smoother picture where you see how each particle is moving, basically. And I guess from this you can also see that this is actually highly used in uh, image analysis and all this stuff as well. So all this, like, I don't know if you remember this face app, this Russian app, this was also based on optimal transport. Okay. Um, how much time do I have left? Eight minutes. Eight minutes even, okay. Then I can also do this mathematical slide. Um, <laughs> okay, I, we now had um, 10,000 points, but what if the number is different? I mean, this has to also be, to be solved somehow. And this can, of course, then be generalized mathematically to so-called probability distributions and probability measures. Um, even even further, but I only talk about this here, but I don't want to use measure theory, um, but we only consider discrete uh, probability measures, so final probability measures, which you can ba basically write as a sum with some weights, so meaning how likely it is to draw a point xi, and this delta xi means this is just, if I just write delta xi, it means there's no randomness, it just means I always pick xi. And Okay, and so it means you have n, oh, sorry, uh, okay, here we are. Uh, it means this is a probability mesh on n points and each of those points has cho uh, chance AI to be picked. And analogously for a second measure, um, nu. So those are weights, summing to one. And then we don't necessarily have a transport anymore because if the number of points is not the same, there is no map, basically. And then what we actually consider here are so-called couplings, and we define this set of admissible couplings as the set of all matrices. So meet n is the number of points of the first measure and m the number of points of the second measure, which has some constraints, meaning that uh, this is then actually a, can be interpreted as a probability measure on uh, product space, meaning on the uh, yeah um, on the space which has. Um, R2D in this case, and which has the right marginals, meaning if you project it down to the first marginals, you obtain the original measure, and in the other case, the other measure. And then you again have some costs of this coupling, which is basically, this, uh, this is a replacement of the previous slide of the sum with the transport map, um, and you again want to minimize this. And then you take a square root, okay, and this, what you call have here, is the so-called uh, Wasserstein distance. And the Wasserstein distance is then the distance between those, those two probability measures. And again, to come back to the example I had in the beginning, consider two point clouds, then um, we, we now here, okay, you have to look very carefully, but what actually happens is, because the number of points is not the same, some points are splitted. So, and also the size of the point is basically the mass, so the probability that it is chosen. So this is also splitted somehow. All right. We now have covered a distance between probability measures. We also need to form means or like some sort of average. And this is, 
uh, so-called Wasserstein Barry centers. And again, if we have n probability measures and some weights, it, you can forget about the weights if you want, it's not that important. Um, you um, look at the following problem, which basically says you want to find a measure, a probability measure, which is as close as possible to all the other measures you considered in the Wasserstein distance, but you have you cannot be the closest to one, you have to kind of be simultaneously as close as possible. And okay, uh, not speaking mathematically, but maybe just geometrically, or like maybe to give a slight intuition of what this does is, um, I guess everyone knows normal distributions, so consider two, two densities of a normal distribution um, with the same variance, sigma squared, but with different mean x0 and x1. What the wasserstein barry center of those two probability measures is, it's just a normal distribution in between that one would like to have, I guess, in most situations. And so in between means you obtain a normal distribution with same variance, and the mean is just the average of the two other means. All right, so now we have the two tools, and we can look at the Wasserstein clustering problem. So this is basically exactly the same as we had in the k-means, the only difference, okay, I call all call measures mu, and earlier I called point x, that's the only difference. And the difference is also the distance we use. We don't have the Euclidean norm anymore, but we actually look at the Wasserstein distance, or the squared Wasserstein distance in this case. And then one can do precisely the same steps uh, with Lloyd, with the so-called Lloyd algorithm, meaning you would first put each measure into that cluster to which Barry center is it, it is closest to, and then you update the centroids by um, using the Wasserstein Barry center. And then you can do the same thing with projections, but I don't do this now. I want to give a, just a, a very simple toy example of what happens. So here are six probability measures. Each just has three points to, uh, possible to be chosen. And you want to, okay, again, I somehow used the number three here, want to obtain three clusters. Um, so what you get in the end after the algorithm is you get you get um, um, free clusters and berry centers, and here you actually see that always a point uh, uh, a point of the berry center is exactly the mean of two points in the, of the measures in that cluster. All right, and also a, a slight picture because we also dealt uh, with missing values in this case, meaning that you don't see uh, some coordinates of the of the measures. Um, okay, maybe this gets uh, slightly confusing, but again, for example, this like uh, pink measure, uh, you only know the x coordinates of the three support points, but you don't know where to put them on the y axis. And then uh, maybe just to see of what happens, um, let's just look at this one here at the left bottom corner. Um, you, we basically obtain again the same um, cl clusters, cluster memberships. So in this toy example, it's preserved. And the three support points of the Barry Center, okay, now first this was rose and this is really pink now. Um, you see that in the Y coordinates, it actually obtains uh, precisely the points of this, of this red measure of this mu4, because the only other measure in that cluster is the rose one, which doesn't have any Y coordinates. And in the X coordinates, it's again as previously, um, as previously seen. All right, I think. I have like, do I have one minute? Two, minutes. two even, okay. <laughs> then I can show you, a, a, a talk about a slight um, application or like a slide of what we did with all this stuff. Um, in the end, we considered something like 500 distributions in like, yeah, uh, seven dimensions or something. You can also, uh, for example, combine classical k-means with Wasserstein k-means because you can always consider the product measure of a measure with uh, uh, a point, with a single single point measure, basically. And, and we actually combined seven distribution, uh, seven dimensional measures which, with uh, vectors of dimension about 500 or 600, and we considered 500 of those. Each mm, we kind of downsampled to, to about 100 or 200 observations, and then we tried to cluster those and then we obtain classes in a very high dimensional space because the space of probability measures is actually infinite. And, but what we could do in the end, we could use also our clustering algorithm for imputation, meaning we are clustered without imputing anything. And then we could actually use 
the coordinates of the points or measures in the same cluster, which are close in the, um, in the coordinates we know. So this, in, in that case, we hope to get away some bias. And then what we did, we lifted it actually to a much higher dimensional space and were able to kind of embed all the observations we had, which earlier lived in different uh, dimensions, have in the same space, and we could calculate some pairwise distances and then uh, kind of try to represent all those distances or all those points in R3. So in this picture, every point is one measure, actually one very high dimensional measure, um, but then projected down into R3, and you see like a representation of these clusters, and those are like, as I said, 500 distributions in about like, uh, um, yeah, uh, in about, I think it was 12 clusters. And you see, okay, maybe some overlapped, but this is due to projecting down from a super high dimensional uh, uh, space to a low dimensional space. And what we are actually then interested in the end is, okay, who, which measures or distribution are, are somewhat similar and which are not, or which are very different. So you see right at the left there, there is a point completely uh, out, and this is what interests us. And this, with this, I want to thank with um, also um, mentioning my two very nice supervisors, which are uh, my PhD supervisors at the University of Vienna, Julio Bakov and Matthias Beigelberg, with whose this work arose from. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Again, we have some time for questions. I know everyone is looking forward to the break, but no drinks without at least one question. So <laughs> there we go. Do you need a microphone? Uh, if you want, doesn't hurt. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for your talk, Lawrence. Uh, I was wondering um, for the Wasserstein metric, what if I want to like measure the distance between a differently sized measures, so like R D and R L, for example? Like how I guess you need some kind of protection to make them comparable? Mm, actually, uh, for Wasserstein distance, yes, but optimal transport works between measures on any spaces, on any Polish spaces, so-called, which are okay. uh, metric spaces, which are, okay, now it gets mathematical, <laughs> we can talk afterwards, but um, yeah, optimal transport is defined on any, um, uh, between measures on any two Polish spaces, but the Wasserstein distance is actually a lift of the original matrix structure of the space you are considering. So, for example, if I consider probability measures, we just have chance of picking one point, then there's actually no uh, randomness, and I want to calculate their distance, it's actually precisely the distance between the points uh, in the original space. So in order to get a distance, you always need to have some underlying mm -hmm. distance on the, on the space. Thanks. Any other question? There's one. You're quicker or I'm quicker, we can see. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, is the disregarding of uh, the co coordinate in, the, in lower dimensions uh, more of a bias than when I add more dimensions? Mm. Um, quick questions, uh, quick answer, reply would be no bias because I don't do anything, like I don't reintroduce inf information I don't have. So, uh, uh, no, in, uh, but, uh, but of course the coordinates which are there play a much bigger role if the dimension is lower. Thank you, because yeah. it was more of, um, if I disregard the y-axis and only have the x-axis, a uh, total outlier of the, the data set I wanted to measure. Um, sorry, I lost my thought. Thank you. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 it's completely fine. Um, yeah, the, the idea was basically just to, to not introduce bias. And of course, if it would be a super outlier in the Y coordinate, we have no idea. But if you would impute it, you would always have no outlier, basically, because most imputation may first take some sort of mean of the data. But it's, uh, it's, uh, I understand also that um, it's, it's a bit confusing, yeah. Uh, it's counterintuitive so sometimes. Another question? We still have time for one, I would say. If that is not the case, let's 
freshen up our minds in the break. Thank you again very much, Lorenz.